Hello all sentient beings and welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode where we talk about all news, comics, and media related to the... On this episode of Transmissions Alt Mode, we review Transformers Optimus Prime issue 21. Transformers Unicron issues 1 and 2 are getting a second printing and a new online webcomic Trolls Charles. Today is Friday, August 17th, 2018 and this is episode 90 of Transmissions Alt Mode. Welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode, the podcast that starts legacy numbering episodes next week. I'm your host, Charles, a.k.a. Big C, and I'm joined by the excellent Transmissions team. Jeremy, a.k.a. Yakko. Hey, how you doing? And Daryl, the Cybertronian Beast. Sup? Let's talk Transformers. You may have heard that uh, this week we are celebrating our fifth anniversary of Transmissions, so um, Alt Mode... It, isn't quite as long because we we didn't we split off alt mode in 2016 so we're only we're we're coming up on two years for alt mode but it's part of the whole transmissions network so it gets uh grandfathered in there uh so uh let's talk about some donations uh thank you to Alyssa, who just joined the patreon this week uh we hope to have you around for a long time 100th Donatrion, assuming everyone uh, stay, all our Donatrions stay on until the end of the month, we will be opening up that Transmissions Declassified to all of our regular listeners. Congratulations to you, and thank you to Alyssa for making this possible, and all our Donatrion. And uh, if you'd like to join us, you can go to transmissionspodcast.com slash support. And uh, if you're not a Donatrion now, you can go join through Patreon or PayPal. Like that, lots of perks, including listening to the shows live, getting our Till All or One classic, uh, our exclusive cover comic, and uh, getting that transmissions declassified early compared to uh, now, now that it's going to everyone, but you guys will get the episodes first. All right, so uh, we just had our mega contest, so congratulations to all of the winners of our fifth anniversary mega contest. We gave right away five awesome prize packs to five lucky Donatrions. So I'm sure they will enjoy those prizes. All right, let's uh, get into some comics news. First up, we've got the Transformers Legends online manga. There's issues or episode 52 and 53. Uh, I think this is the finale of their uh, of their manga for this uh, for the legends toy line so these were all the prime wars trilogy lines that were were produced as the legends line in in uh, japan under takara and they've been doing lots of uh, these web comics to accompany them uh, i think a, a lot of the art is done by hayato sakamoto who has also done some of the idw comics and uh, in particular, I want to talk about issue uh, or episode 53 because Sakamoto did some crazy things where he actually gave cameos to some of the IDW uh, Transformers artists and writers. In, uh, in that comic, he put in Marcelo Mater, James Roberts, and Josh Perez. And it was just great to see them. I mean, in particular, Josh Perez is in... Is in heaven with a field of bumblebees all surrounding him. So that's awesome. Uh, Marcelo Mater is, is uh, surrounded by some of the, um, the South American uh, transformers, which I think uh, he's from Brazil. Ar- where is he from Argentina or Brazil? I can't remember. Sorry, Marcelo. <laughs> he, he lives in British Columbia now, I think. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but he's from South America. If you say so, I thought he was from British Columbia. <laughs> Why don't you just move on to uh, your crush? He's not from, he's not from British Columbia. He's he there now. now. Yes. <laughs> move on to your boyfriend. Are you from Are you from Wisconsin, Jeremy? Right now I am. <laughs> if I call the radio show, I'd be like, hi, I'm Jeremy from Wisconsin. All right. You guys, trolling me as bad as Kyle. Okay. <laughs> Five years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and james roberts uh he had who were the guys that were thunderclash and the other guy i don't know 
and some kind of barbarian. Oh and, uh, yeah, Th- Thunderclash and Skyquake. And the, uh, he's holding a copy of Lost Light. Yeah. Might. Am I not being heard? I feel like I'm just being ignored here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Daryl. I did hear you. Sorry. Yes, you're right. I did hear you. <laughs> but no, I, I think I just thought those cameos were <laughs> that they got into this this uh, Japanese comic. It's funny. Yeah, I think the Moonbase guys actually go through these after they've been translated. Oh, cool. Well, mm-hmm. Check back on. Well, check back with their podcast <laughs> and let us know how how the comic is. All right. Uh, next up, we have finally got a tiny tidbit of news about the upcoming reboot of the IDW Transformers comics. <laughs> You're um, telling me. <laughs> I, I am shocked, shocked <laughs> that they're going to reboot in 2019. <laughs> so yeah. So uh, ICV2 had an interview with Greg Goldstein. Uh, part two of this interview just uh, went up. And Greg Goldstein is the, uh, for those who don't know, he's the publisher of IDW Comics. And uh, yeah, he doesn't have a whole lot of information, but he just says, our Transformers reboot for 2019 is going to be great. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I think we had all always speculated that it was going to start in 2019. Because all, I think most of the reboots have always started in January. But did we think it was going to be great? I think the news here is that they actually, this is the first actual confirmation that they got it. Because mm-hmm. we were all speculating, because John Barber, he was mentioning stuff, but he never actually came out and said, yes, we're, good. We, we're still doing Transformers. Well, they have said that since then. They, they said it at, yeah. at SDCC in the SDCC panel. They did say there will be more Transformers comics. Yeah, but were they referring to the stuff that the Star Trek and Transformers stuff? No, they, they said they they're going to have a new continuity. They just never put a time frame on it. Okay, all right. Well, I'm expecting so, they're they're going to wait until New York Comic Con, and that's when they're going to do it because you don't want to torpedo sales of your current stuff. Uh, the next bit of news we have is about uh, Bumblebee movie tie-in books. So we've got junior novels for the Bumblebee movie adaptation that will be coming soon. So we've got uh, an audio CD for the novel as well, and a Kindle audio book. Uh, there's a junior reader book that's called A New Car for Charlie and shows Bumblebee and Charlie there. Uh, so, yeah, all these looks like they're all coming out in November, November 20th. So you've got a hardcover, paperback, and audio CD. But where's the Audible version? Well, uh, if it's Kindle, I'm sure there'll be an Audible version. Yeah. Amazon owns everything. <laughs> yeah, they do. And, it, and this comes out, like the, the junior novel comes out a month before the movie, which I think is fairly common. So if you don't want to spoil yourself, don't don't read it. All right, and our last uh, bit of comics news is some good news, at least for Transformers Unicron. Looks like Unicron number one and two sold well enough to get a second printing in September of 2018. So that's good news. Mm-hmm. That's been a, quite a while since uh, a Transformers book got a second printing. Yeah, and we have a quote from IDW Editor-in-Chief John Barber. I'm thrilled at the response readers and fans have had for Unicron. We've given our all to make this story the biggest, best, most emotionally charged story we can. Unicron means a lot to me, to artist Alex Milne, colorist Sebastian Chang, letterer Tom Long, editor David Marriott, and to everybody at IDW and Hasbro. This is a big moment in our Transformers comics. It's the end of a huge story, and it's the Cybertronian's biggest battle. Plus, for me, knowing what we have planned next for the Transformers, I can't contain my excitement at everybody coming on board for Unicron. So that's interesting. That's another indication of what's coming next for Transformers. It's going to tie into the toy line. I mean, come on. And so this second printing, these issues should be out on September 12th is what uh, we've got news here. Uh, In the chat, T.F. Allen is reminding us that Transformers versus Visionaries number one got a second printing earlier this year. Mm. So we don't count that. (laughs) Uh, Make of that what you will. All the Visionaries fans out there buying up all the books. Somehow I don't think that momentum was sustained through the the next 
three issues of the Visionaries miniseries. But I digress. All right, and our uh, oh, so now this is not really, I guess, comics Transformers comics news, but <laughs> I think we all wanted to mention it. Friend of the show and Donatrion Tom B. Long has uh, started his own web comic uh, called Comic Book Nobody, which uh, is a humorous look at a graphic artist working at a big name comic book company and all the trials and tribulations he goes through as he <laughs> avoids work and insults his coworkers. And uh, I think Tom might, uh, might've been uh, poking a little fun at transmissions and I guess me in particular, <laughs> because uh, yeah. <laughs> so we'll, we'll have a link in the chat. You can check out the, he has set up a Twitter account for atomic or for a comic book. Nobody. Uh, you can go read the comic. I'm sure everyone, everyone who listens to this show will get the joke. <laughs> because it's hilarious. <laughs> this one, we want to really thank our Patreon supporters and donators. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> five years. <laughs> to be fair, I think it's only been like three years for that. <laughs> it's like a prison sentence. <laughs> And that just counts up. It doesn't count down. All right. I'm trying to, I'm trying to plan a, uh, I, I don't, I don't have any graphic artist skills, but I might be trying to figure out a response to this. <laughs> we'll, see. we'll see. We'll see what I can come up with. You're an engineer. Just build something. <laughs> just, just build, a, just build a graphic artist comic robot. <laughs> you, you claim to be a software engineer. You can write a program to do it. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, let's move on to our comic review. Transmissions wouldn't be what it is today without the awesome support of our listeners. If you'd like to support our shows and enjoy the exclusive benefits that our donors get, please visit transmissionspodcast.com slash support. This week we are reviewing Optimus Prime number 21, The Falling, Chapter 6, Unforgivable. Written by John Barber, art by Kei Zama, pages 5 to 11, Sarah Peter Drew O'Shea, pages 12, 13, 17 to 20, uh, and Livio Ramondelli, pages 1 to 4 and 14 to 6. Colors by Josh Burcham and Livio Ramondelli, letters by Tom B. Long, editor David Marriott, publisher Greg Goldstein. We have three covers this week. The cover A is by Kei Zama and Josh Burcham and shows Aileron and RC reaching out, their hands reaching out for each other. Cover B by Casey Collar and John Paul Bove. This is uh, the stylized uh, falling covers that Casey's been doing. And then the retailer incentive cover is the line art but for cover A, Kei Zama. So, uh, Daryl, uh, which cover do you like here? Uh, well, I have been getting uh, all the Casey covers because they're awesome. So I did get that one, but I had to get the the uh, cover A. The Kazama cover is absolutely gorgeous this month, and uh, yeah, it's just it's uh, it's it. I don't know if you know it. Even before I knew what happened in the story, I was I, I saw this cover and, and knew I had to get this one because of just the it doesn't really depict emotion but it depicts it like uh, i'm struggling for the word here like um, desperation or... yeah there you go desperation yeah so it's it's and just the the grittiness of the background and the you know the destruction in the area and it just it looked really awesome so yeah i had to get this one too. so yeah i double dipped on this this book cool jeremy uh which cover are you picking uh, I actually like the cover, um, I guess the R.I., the black and whites of the Gehazama. I agree with everything Daryl said about what it's like conveying. I just think something with the black and white just kind of, I don't know, it just adds something to it for me. And like, whereas like, I think the last issue we had, the, the Beast Wars Megatron and Optimus, where the black and whites were, were a little bit too busy and the colors really brought a lot of distinction out for the different characters. This one is so stark anyway. I, I think it's just having the only color on there being the, the logo text and, you know, down the corner. I just, I, I love this image. 
I'm going to pick cover B, uh, the Casey Collar cover, uh, just because I, I really like the what he's been doing with those images. Uh, this one is the silhouette is Pyra Magna, and then all the characters are uh, are superimposed in there. I do like cover A. Uh, one thing I, I really want to call out in the in cover A is the washed out glowing effect that Josh Burcham has added to the colors. I, I think it's really cool. Like you can see it, it, it gives you the feeling that it's, it's being bathed in light there. And it's just a really cool effect. And I think that does enhance the, the lines that Keizama put in here. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that these are both all three really strong covers. All right, let's, uh, let's get into this story. As the battle between Devastator and Victorian rages, Torchbearer leader Pyra Magna has an internal reflection on when Optimus Prime arrived on Caminus, bringing the Combiner Wars with him. After Pyra Magna's former Torchbearer leader and mentor Presidia Magna was murdered by Onyx Prime years ago, she'd lost faith in the Primes and wasn't impressed with Optimus. The Mistress of Flame's uncritical acceptance of Optimus Prime led Pyra Magna to become disillusioned with her and drove her to take the Torchbearers to the Sea of Rust on Cybertron where they eventually came into contact with the Enigma of Combination and became Victorian. Meanwhile, on the ground, Shockwave tells Jetfire he needs help to transfer a small amount of data, as Aileron warns Jetfire unnecessarily not to trust him. Shockwave tells them that Optimus Prime, falling into the Crystal City, Singularity destroyed his body and compressed his matter into a realm of pure information. Now they can extract that information and bring him back. In the background, the singularity turns glowing white and begins to expand. Jetfire asks the obvious question, why does Shockwave want to rescue Prime now when he put him there in the first place? Shockwave doesn't offer a good answer, only saying the situation has changed and, and his plans have to change with it. Some distance away, Liege Maximo takes his prisoner RC back to the Maximal Giant Eye ship, but they're on the ground while the Maximal ship hovers high in orbit. R.C. asks Liege Maximo how they're supposed to get up there. As Liege Maximo answers, they all begin to levitate up. The Maximal ship is using Ore 4, harvested from Caminus, which has the power of gravity. R.C. isn't impressed. Liege Maximo holds R.C.'s energy sword pointed at her, thinking he's got control. But R.C. was just playing possum. She yanks on her chains, pulling the surprised Maximal guards off balance, kicks the sword out of Maximo's hand, Slicing the hands of her guards off and grabbing the sword back. She flings the sword at the Maximal ship's gravity beam projector high above, shattering it. With the gravity control shut off, Liege Maximo, RC, and all the Maximals begin to plummet back to the surface. Liege Maximo, unluckily, was right above Devastator and he has slammed the hook's crane on Devastator's shoulder, smashing him to, into two pieces dead. RC is resigned to falling to her death as well, but Aileron transforms to her jet mode and catches RC before she crashes, saving her life. Devastator is surprised to see Maximals raining down on him from above, and at the same time, he feels weaker. Victorion realizes what's happening. Devastator wasn't resisting her gravity powers with his innate strength. It was only because the Maximal ship was projecting a second gravity field around him, protecting him. With the field gone, Victorion slams Devastator into the expanding singularity, vaporizing him. On the ground, Aileron braces for RC to give her another snide remark about not being able to finish Devastator off herself. But RC surprises her with a simple thank you in the form of a completely never foreshadowed big old kiss on the lips. Inside Crystal City, Optimus Prime has opened the Matrix and its energy is streaming out of the singularity. Even Bumblebee, who had confidence that he and Prime would escape their black hole prison, is surprised at how quickly things are moving. The Matrix energy continues to flow out, but the Matrix starts to collapse as its information flows out of the Singularity. On the other side of the Singularity, the Torchbearers have separated and Pyra Magna finds Jetfire to update him on the situation. Then she sees Shockwave standing there with him. Jetfire tells her this is who Onyx Prime was under his armor, which sets Pyra Magna off. She immediately attacks Shockwave for murdering her friend all those years ago on Kaminus. Shockwave blocks her attack and indicates he isn't here to fight. He needs her to help rescue his only, quote-unquote, friend, Optimus Prime. Shockwave cracks open a vial of Cybertron's energon that had been corrupted by the Visionary's talisman energy. 
It interacts with the Crystal City Singularity, causing a chain reaction. Information as pure light energy floods out of the Singularity, and Shockwave reveals the final step of his plan. He used Jetfire as bait to bring Pyra Magna here so she could become the host for Optimus Prime's mind energy. As the reaction intensifies, both Bumblebee and Optimus escape the singularity of infraspace and go into anti-space, the combiner mindscape inside Pyramagna's consciousness. But Optimus and Bumblebee don't take over Pyramagna's mind. They're all on the same page regarding stopping Shockwave, and they leave her in full control. Pyramagna severs Shockwave's gun arm, pointing it back at him. She's ready to kill him for all the death and destruction he's caused throughout the eons. And Prime and Bumblebee won't stop her. Back in Iacon, Starscream is back to his old tricks. And they're working. He's convincing the Decepticons to follow him again. In the shadows, Soundwave prepares to assassinate Starscream so the Decepticons won't be led astray again. But Needlenose stops him. Murdering people you don't agree with is how Cybertron got plunged into 4 million years of war in the first place. Needlenose argues that if Soundwave is so mad, Starscream is better at getting the Decepticons to listen to him than he is, then it's all about Soundwave's ego and not about what's best for his people. As the Maximal ship begins to leave now that Shockwave has been stopped, Starscream gathers up the remaining Decepticons and leads them to another place where they can prepare for the next step. Starscream declares that Cybertron will be theirs or they'll burn it to the ground. Soundwave reluctantly lets them go. But not everyone bought Starscream's snake oil. Recent Camion Decepticon recruit Swift isn't convinced, and Fat, or I should say Fast, Tankor stayed behind too. Just then, Trax appears, looking for his brother Needlenose. Needlenose steps out of the shadows, ready to reconcile with his brother and be done with fighting. And Windblade finds Soundwave, telling him that Shockwave is captured, Optimus and Bumblebee are alive, sort of, while the Maximal attack has been thwarted. Soundwave obviously did not murder Alpha Trion, so he's off the hook. But Soundwave still carries the guilt for his actions, murdering Horrible and now letting Starscream go. Finally, Pyramagna brings the defeated Shockwave before the Council of War. Alita One, the Mistress of Flame, and even Marissa Fairborn think Shockwave should have just been executed for all his many crimes. But Pyramagna, with Optimus and Bumblebee still inside her mind, tells them that she had to do what was right, not what feels good. Shockwave will face justice, but Cybertron must face the truth that there are no primes. Shockwave responds that this was his plan all along. Destroy the Matrix, show how the primes are just myth and exaggeration, and the Decepticons are stripped of their ideology for equality. All this elaborate scheming was done to prepare for the coming of Unicron. And that is the merciful end falling. So, okay, this is an ending, but, you know, kind of just the end of the beginning because we're moving on to Unicron, the Unicron arc right after this. It is kind of anticlimactic since we did get Unicron number one before this and uh, and free comic book day. Unicron number zero also, you know, I mean, I don't think it had much spoilers uh, for this issue in particular, but Unicron number one definitely did. This issue came out a week after Unicron and we're just reviewing it you know, several weeks later, but I, you know, I, I still feel like this, this issue was a bit all over the place, similar to last issue that we reviewed last week. It's a bit convoluted, all the stuff that's going on with Optimus and Bumblebee being turned into information and being sucked into Pyramagda's mind and, and Shockwave's, I, I don't really understand Shockwave's plan. He's got like, He's playing like, you know, 11th dimensional chess and no one understands what he's trying to do. Yeah. It feels like it's just, I mean, the whole falling story arc just feels like pushing things into place for Unicron, but I don't think it even really did a, did a great job of that. So that's, I'm sorry to say it's, it's, it's another like meh issue for me. I did want to point out just a couple of things that I, that jumped out at me as, Slight errors uh, in the beginning of the book when Pyra Magna is having the flashback about when they, you know, she got the Enigma of Combination. That goes back to the Combiner Hunters comic. Uh, but in the issue, it is referred to as Titan Hunter. So slight editorial mistake there. And uh, another one was that when Jetfire is uh, talking to Aileron, where Ail- uh, I think it's what, page three? 
where Aileron says, don't trust Jetfire, don't trust Shockwave. And Jetfire says, uh, uh, that's what the indigent tone of my voice is. That I think that was meant to be indignant, not indigent, because indigent means like poor, indignant means angry. So the funny thing, though, is that way back in the early years of the IDW, Simon Furman used indigent incorrectly in several comics. He used it to mean indigenous. So I just thought it was it was really interesting that apparently indigent is a word that IDW has trouble with. <laughs> or, or maybe this was just a callback to the other misuses. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> it's like, the readers will know what, what Jeff R. means. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, so that's that's my overall take. Uh, but Daryl, uh, what did you think of this this final issue of The Falling? Uh, well, uh, I was also kind of meh on it. There was some battling. I was happy to see some battling. Uh, I was uh, definitely a little bit intrigued as the uh, Liege Maximo, you know, got uh, bisected on the, the crane arm of uh, Devastator there. That was uh, gross and, and pretty awesome. <laughs> but yeah, that was uh, that was pretty cool. The the part that kind of to, took me out of it a bit were the the multiple artists. Livio's art does tend to be the flashbacks, and and that's been kind of a mainstay. So I got that, but it you know it did t- change a bit between uh, Kay's and Sarah's art, and you could tell you could tell whose was whose. One of the things that I did see kind of you know cropping up on like Facebook groups and stuff like that, other social medias was the the kiss. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that to be any kind of romantic thing. I just believe it to be just a just a thank you kind of a thing. Just I don't think there's supposed to be any kind of romantic gesture there. It's just supposed to be RC trying to show thanks to Aileron, maybe embracing a, a, a female side of herself. I know a lot of people are looking at it as a romantic thing. Uh, I don't know what you didn't really comment on it too much there. What was your take on on that that whole scene there? Yeah, that that was that was a little bit uh, weird for me. Um, I did take it to be to at least as the indication to be romantic. I mean that that kiss looks pretty non platonic to me. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah. but my my bigger issue though is that we have virtually no setup of this. I mean, we've had several interactions of RC and Aileron in past books, but nothing to indicate that they had any kind of attraction with each other. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, that feels kind of out of, out of left field. Aileron looks to be completely unexpected of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in previous issues, uh, RC has shown absolutely no interest at at all. And, And, I'm not against this as far as, you know, a coupling because they've been hanging out quite a bit and it would seem like it would be something that might happen. But like you said, there's, there's been no setup. There's been no kind of teases as something's, you know, kind of grinding in their, in their minds as to something, you know, they're thinking about, but great choice of words there. (laughs) Yeah. I think this is something that's suffering from the, the end of the book. It's probably rushed where they're, there might have been other scenes that would have been put in had there been, you know, the series continuing. And this was probably just something that John wanted to make sure he got in to the book. Right. So it, it does feel out of place with very little setup, but I think we're supposed to infer that they've been spending a lot of time together and that's kind of right. And something's happened, I guess. Yeah. Um, Cause you know, whenever two people spend a lot of time together, they immediately become rom- romantically involved. Of course. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Just like if you get any number of Decepticons together in a, in a single room, they start to combine. <laughs> yeah, other than that, I, I mean, the book was, like you said, it was meh. Um, I, I didn't feel that it was, you know, any particular you know, intriguing part. I did, well, there was the part where Pyromagna disabled Shockwave by simply just pulling his arm off. It was like, nobody ever saw this. He's like, He's got one weapon, it's attached to him take it off <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh that's brilliant um i'm curious to see what's going to happen with you know i mean we know they come back but i mean how prime and bumblebee i mean it's in it's in issue 22 so if you've if i haven't i haven't read ahead okay 
Yeah. So well, it's 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 the it's it all explained there. So okay, but uh, but yeah. So anyway, yeah, meh. Yeah, I mean, I'm also curious if I mean this kiss moment. It's not really even followed up on in this book. I don't know if we're go- like we've seen RC in uh, in Unicron. We haven't really seen her and Aileron interacting much after this moment. So I wonder if this is even going to be touched on in the last few issues of either Optimus Prime or Unicron. It just feels a bit, I guess, superfluous or gratuitous in the sense that it's not going to be referenced or, or used in any anything else. So I don't know. But the art was pretty. <laughs> it looked like it was a really good, uh, weird, well drawn. I did like it. I've got to say that I agree with both of you. It's there. There were a few bits of of really good stuff in here, but as a whole, it was jumbled. And the Livio art didn't seem to be for all flashbacks. There was, you know, the whole mindscape thing was also his art. And it just, I don't know it. I like his art. I just, I think the, the jumping between artists is just, it, it just didn't fit or it, it just, it took you out of it. Yeah, I mean, they did. They didn't do the thing where they they had a one art consist one artist do like different scenes of the story. They had they just broke the book up into pages and had each right. artist do a bunch of pages. So there's no consistency in flowing between the story. Yeah, because you have like Livio showing some of the Victorian Devastator fight, and then when like um, Pyra rips off Shockwave's arm. That's also Livio. And then the next page is the, I guess that's the Sarah stuff because that's her star scream. And it's just jumping from, I don't know. I, I think three artists is probably too much for any book like this, but two, you need to do it with one artist focused on one set, like one environment. And another artist focused on another environment. Mm-hmm. Um, I do like this uh, as we see, you know, we know Bumblebee is coming back. This is how they justify the new um, evergreen design for Bumblebee. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we'll get into that more with the the next Optimus Prime issue, but you can see it on the the cover of the next issue. Yep. And Shockwave's plan still makes no damn sense. (laughs) It, It makes absolutely no sense. I mean, it seems like there was a big plan at the beginning and then some editorial change happened or something where maybe because the book has to be wrapped up so quickly, it just all fell apart. And it it was just kind of like, yeah, we got in this arc so we can get to Unicron. Let's just kind of, we we know we have to bring back Optimus and Bumblebee. We'll do that and move on. It just, it did make no sense. Mm -hmm. I will say though, on the art, the, the art from all three artists does look good. It's just the, the shift between the, the three in, in the midst of the story, just kind of it's, the, the shift is jarring. Mm-hmm. I do really like how, uh, you know, this is, I think at least this is one of the first times we're getting pair. We're pairing Josh Burcham's Optimus prime colors with Sarah Peter drew O'Shea's art. And mm-hmm. I, I like that. It's, it's really nice. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's a different from like, I think on till all or one, she ha- was always paired with either Priscilla Tramontano or Joanna La Fuente, which you had the the shinier, more uh, you know, more vibrant colors. And here with the the flat G two style colors, it's a it's a nice contrast. Mm-hmm. All right, so I guess that's it for Optimus Prime number twenty one. So let's move on to some Transformers media news. All right, in media news this week. We've got Transformers Forge to fight. Boy, that thing's still going. All right. Well, they're adding G1 Wheeljack to the fight. Uh, so if you are still playing that, you can earn a G1 Wheeljack and uh, use him to battle. Right on. Uh, next up, we've got new images of Shatter and Dropkick in their alt modes for from Bumblebee the movie. And uh, it's just a picture of the muscle cars with lights on. There you go. You want to do that? We're going to get a lot of this crap in the next little while. Um, Bumblebee, the movie poster, a new poster. And it's with Charlie and Bumblebee. Bumblebee's kneeling down to look at her 
I guess. All right. And we've got uh, promotional items for Bumblebee the movie uh, that you can buy when you're at the theater. The $25 popcorn bucket uh, and some keychains and minion looking thing cups and all kinds of crap yeah toppers coasters all kinds of crazy crap but yeah so if you're if you're into that that kind of stuff you can buy this when you go to the movie theater uh it will be insanely expensive but uh yeah it always is uh next up we have some screen caps from the film these are provided by a couple of different uh news outlets one of them is empire uh this one shows bumblebee uh, all sat on his behind inside a residential house. It's uh, cute, I guess. Um, that's it. That's the whole image. Um, and we got a second image from the movie. This one comes from Entertainment Weekly. Shows uh, Charlie uh, holding Bumblebee's head in her hands. So cute. A couple screen caps there. Next up, we have rumors from Bumblebee the movie. And appearance of Cybertron. So this is a spoilery thing. So I'm not going to really discuss it all that much. Also, I never read it. And I don't know what to say. But uh, it has to do with the planet Cybertron appearing in the movie. So uh, if you want to if you want to take a look at that, go ahead and read the article. Yeah. And they did mention in the SCCC panel that there was going to be some Cybertron in the movie. Yeah, which is cool. And lastly, we have our first footage of Transformers Cyberverse. It's about two minutes, and it's a clip from Cartoon Network, direct from them. And uh, you can take a look at the clip there. It's uh, in the show notes. And it's got a a bit of a fight scene between Windblade and Thundercracker. And Windblade is trying to get Bumblebee to remember something. Anything, actually. Really, anything. Yeah, I watched it, and he has apparently no memories at this point. Mm -hmm. So I'm expecting this to be like the first scene of the first episode. And he doesn't even remember how to talk. (laughs) Yeah. He has a mouth and he talks via the radio. Yes. So this is a problem um, for us hardcore fans. But uh, we've been reminded by Charles that uh, we're not the... uh, you know, the main audience for this and the kids that are watching this are growing up on the Bay movies. So they know the Michael Bay Bumblebee and this is who that is. But take a look at the clip. Um, There are some screenshots of in this article as well. They took screenshots of basically every scene. It's Windblade does a lot of talking. Thundercracker, I don't believe talks at all, does some grunting as he gets uh, some punches thrown and some punches received. But uh, and Bumblebee does a lot of broadcasting, I guess it's not talking, but it's communicating with via the radio podcasting. There you go. <laughs> bot podcast. There's no RSS feed. It is not a podcast. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Take a look at that. I particularly I mean, Charles and I were talking about it at the start uh, before we started recording. It's uh, the animation looks pretty good. It's uh, it's definitely that uh, that like 3D, you know, animation. It's 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 a little bit more 3D than the RID 2015 show, but it's it's definitely not as as not as heavy as the Transformers Prime. So you take a look and and let us know what you think. For Jeremy, what did you think? It's definitely better than than the Prime Wars trilogy. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Right on. And that's it for media news. All right. Uh, Well, let's move on to swarming pop culture. Uh, Daryl, you found this item, didn't you? I did. This is a video that was that popped up the last couple of days. This is the Cybertronic Spree. Is a, a band that dresses up as characters from the 1986 Transformers movie, and these guys decided to uh, just the characters of Hot Rod and RC decided to get hammered and play some acoustic Transformers uh, songs. The basically, more specifically, rather, the theme to the 86 Transformers movie. And uh, it's pretty good. It's The video is only two and a half minutes long. I must say the theme sounds really good acoustically. So you want to hear a bit? Go ahead. This Yeah. 
pretty good yeah i'm a I sucker like for yeah. acoustic yeah so take dragon, a look at that dragon prime does not agree in the chat <laughs> oh well <laughs> can't please everybody but uh yeah so they're they're a pretty good band and they come to uh a couple tf cons put on a concert uh, i believe one year and uh yeah so they've they've check out their youtube uh page there and uh they've got a bunch of videos up of them singing uh, all the Transformers songs from the movie, as well as some other stuff. And uh, yeah, they're they're really good. All right. Uh, well, that's it for Transformer Pop Culture. And let's move on to some convention news. All right. Uh, this is an all TFCon Chicago convention news segment. We have some announcements of guests. We have uh, Alex Milne, Artist extraordinaire, you know him from Transformers, all the <laughs> the Transformers. Uh, I suspect Unicron will be largely wrapped up by this time, end of October. Is that right, Charles? I believe so, yeah. It, God so, willing, if all the books come out on time. <laughs> you bring your Unicron books to sign it. Hopefully Daryl doesn't have as many books now after TFCon Toronto. Uh, I hope not. Uh, next, we have uh, Transformers writer Flint Dilly, who uh, worked on the original cartoon show. Uh, he's also done work with um, he's he's doing video game stuff now, largely. I think um, he he's worked with Blizzard, I believe. Um, and, but in, in the eighties, he was on GI Joe, Inhumanoids, Visionaries, you know, all all the Hasbro stuff. And then he also co-wrote the uh, Transformers Autocracy, or Autocracy, and um, you know that that trilogy. I think we we got to talk with him, I believe, in 2014. Is that right, Charles? Uh, yes, maybe. And, <laughs> uh, I think that was Charlotte. Uh, that was tw- 2015. Okay, well, I don't. Well, Charles, I'll... Charles, and I got to sit down with him. It was a cool guy. Oh yes, yeah, that was in Charlotte. That was that was 2015 in Charlotte. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, next, we have there's an interview way back in the archive somewhere. Yes, yes. Maybe we'll resurface that. Who knows? Yeah. The next announcement we have is uh, Transformers colorist uh, Thomas Deere is going to be there. He was a colorist. Um, it's not listed here. I don't think he announced it. TFCon didn't announce it, so we don't have all the the stuff. But didn't he do uh, the colors on Mars Attacks? Yes, he did. He, he he worked with um, what's the other the the artist on who's the artist on Mars Attack? Matt Frank. Matt Frank. He's worked with Matt Frank on a couple of books. I think he also did the colors on Spotlight Trail Cutter because Matt Frank did mm-hmm. the art there. Oh yeah, yeah. So they've been paired together on a couple. of I think books. he's done some co- some covers too. Yeah, he has a print he's working on that is a Metroplex. And if you like look, there's a lot of little Easter eggs in there, like uh, Wheeljack Cybertronian vehicle mode. You see like Cliff Jumper and Braun in here and just it, it's a nice looking little picture. Um, so he, he does more than coloring. He's also a good artist. Mm hmm. I met, uh, I think I met Thomas Deere back in BotCon 2014 in Pasadena. Um, and I got some stuff signed by him when I was there. And he listens to the show, I think. He follows on, us on Twitter. I think he the show, too. Cool. So. Well, I, I look forward to meeting him. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe we can sit down with him. Yeah. I haven't met him before. Uh, and then, uh, finally, uh, th- this one is is more close to home. Transmissions artist K Girl, aka Crystal Gonzalez, is going to be attending TFCon Chicago, and she says that she's going to have what, like an art announcement soon or commissions or, or something. But if you like our logo and if you like the artwork that we sent out, I think it was in November, or December of last year, of us recording and driving Mike crazy, it's um, she's going to 
she says she's going to have some prints and commissions open soon. So be looking for that. She's in our discord all the time. So you can contact her there. And that is it for convention news. We, you know, TFCon Chicago is shaping up to be a fun show. Mm -hmm. Sigh. I wasn't going to say it. (laughs) It would be a lot more fun with Charles, but anyway, uh, that is it for convention news this week. All right, well, let's finish up the show with some feedback. And we have a comment on Facebook from Donatrion Kyle. Not comic book nobody Kyle, (laughs) a real life Kyle. Uh, So Kyle (laughs) writes with some corrections, particularly for me. (laughs) What? (laughs) Some corrections regarding comments made during the comic news segment from last episode regarding the unrustable bastards Kickstarter. Jeff senior is not the artist on the comic. He is only providing alternate variant covers. The standard covers and interior art is done by Brian Sevilla. So sorry about that, but yeah, Jeff senior, I like Jeff senior's art, but I'm a little sad to hear he's not doing more for it, but uh, I'm sure Brian Sevilla's art is so cool. Uh, and the other correction is that the cover being homaged is Marvel UK Transformers 113, uh, the first appearance of Death's Head in the Transformers comic. On that 113 cover, Rodimus is calling for the head of Galvatron, not Shock. And yeah, I should have remembered that because 113 is also the first issue that James Roberts picked up in his youth. And he references that number in all his comics. Sorry, everyone, but I have been corrected. Uh, Kyle also has some comments for us. Uh, Otherwise, a really great episode. I'm somewhere in the middle of all your thoughts on uh, the issue covered. That was Optimus Prime number 20. It will be interesting to see how they handle the hardcover Ultimate Collection. I'm curious to see if they'll actually break up Optimus Prime number 22 and slide in Unicron number zero in the middle. I really enjoy everyone's unique and honest take when it comes to reviewing episodes or comics. It's your show. Feel free to be as positive or negative as you wish, as long as it's your honest take on it. So keep up the great work you guys are already doing. Succumb to the pressure of others who want you to tone down the negativity. Art is subjective. If you honestly don't love it, feel free to say so. I enjoy the honest takes. FYI, typically finishes uh, is indicative of the finishing artist inker doing more than just traditional inks. So this is our question about what finishes means uh, in the credits of the comic. It usually means that the penciler or primary artist tackled layouts and looser pencils with more of the heavy lifting as far as finished, polished artwork going to the finisher. In such cases, you typically see the sheen or style of the finisher shine through more in the finished book. Unless, of course, they are trying to emulate someone else's style. So thanks, Kyle, for that informative feedback. Yeah. That, that really make it clears things up a lot mm-hmm. for me. I enjoy when Charles gets correct. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the, um, for the kind words on the reviews. And yeah, we try, we try to be fair and balanced, but not Fox newsy. So, and that's it for feedback. So that will take us to the end of another episode of transmissions alt mode. So we'll see you next week, everybody. Bye-bye. Hi. Later. Thanks for listening to Transmissions. Remember, you can help support the show by donating to us directly via Patreon or PayPal. Once you become a donor, you will receive access to donor-only goodies, like donor-only contests, listening to us record Transmissions live, and getting Transmissions swag at 20% off. You can find links for this at transmissionspodcast.com slash support. Subscribing to us on Stitcher, iTunes, and Google Play is also a great way to support us here at Transmissions. Every subscription we get helps us get better noticed on those services. Leaving us a comment and five-star review doesn't hurt either. Be sure to come chat with us on Discord. You will find a link for Discord at transmissionspodcast.com slash Discord. And of course, you can always send us an email at feedback at transmissionspodcast.com. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you again next week. I'm not going to get used to that. Craig? Uh, There's got to be a way to turn that off. Yeah.
I will check the Craig Discord server. Hey, get the get the fuck on that. <laughs> <laughs> no recording. Welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode, a podcast that starts layering. Le- <laughs> you can say that again. Starts layering. 